Cool, thanks. And now for the main attraction. Da, 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 da. So we have Dave, Dave Anderson to talk about what he did this summer on his break. What I did on my summer vacation. Now you're going to plug mine back in and make it all work? It might even work after I do this. He could have plugged into the switch and just okay. pushed the button. Well, there is a flashing light. That's helpful. It takes a while. There. Ah! There it is. Yay. Success! Yay. Yay. <laughs> I'm going to kill the front light. Anybody has an objection? For those of you who don't know me, I'm David Anderson. I'm a longtime member of the DPRG. And uh, uh, originally, uh, Doug asked me to do a talk on subsumption, which is a, basically a control mechanism for robotics. And uh, I actually did a fairly lengthy talk on subsumption uh, a couple of years ago, which is online on the DPRT uh, website. And so if you're really interested in that, you should go watch that video instead. Uh, I'm going to cover some of those uh, topics today. Uh, basically what I'm doing today uh, is a project that I started about a year and a half ago. And actually David Ackley started this project. He gave me uh, a new Clio 64, an STM. Uh, 32F411, which is a, a pretty neat little processor. And at the time, I was involved in porting the LMX uh, RTOS. Uh, and I ported it to AVR and the ARM. I put it on the Teensy, uh, Uno. And we, we ported it to everything we could think of. And in the course of doing that, as I started playing with this little card, I really liked it. The capabilities here are pretty good. Pretty intense. And so uh, after I got that uh, real time operating system ported over to it, I thought, well, I should, I should you know, put it on a, a robot. And uh, so there were a couple of things that, uh, that I didn't like about it. I think probably, probably everybody in this room is familiar with this part. Is that true? You didn't get anybody familiar with the no. video board? Just a few, just a brief overview. Okay, uh, I'll have to pop up that screen. Uh, here's the card itself, and there's the ARM processor. So, ignoring this upper part there, that's really the whole uh, computer controller. And uh, the. Uh, there's cheers. Please come in. Sit down. Sure. Well, it's all right. we'll, we'll all stare at you when you leave. <laughs> interesting part of this board is this little uh, break-off section here at the top, which is basically a program that allows you to program through a USB port. You can also use that USB port for a virtual COM port to talk to the processor. So that's pretty cool. And the part I didn't like about it is basically they've set it up so that there is an Arduino uh, compatible uh, connector here. And then they have their own, which they call a Morphous connector which basically has all the pins that, uh, that the Arduino didn't connect. So if you were going to plug another board on this, you know, an Arduino shield or something, that's, that's pretty optimally laid out. But if you want to use it on a robot, what you want to do is connect motors and sensors and controllers and servos. and <clears throat> these, these connectors are not well thought out for that. Uh, my experience in the years of building robots is basically everything that you connect to needs power in the ground. <coughs> and probably a signal, probably two signals. If it's a quad encoder, you need two signals. If it's a dual motor controller, you need two signals. If it's a USART, you need two signals. Pretty much you need power and ground and a couple of signals. And that's very clumsy to try to do here. So I built <coughs> this little breakout board, uh, hand constructed. And basically what it does is it takes all those pins and it gives you two buses. And the buses on either side here have ground, power, and then most of them have two signals. Some of them only have one. <clears throat> and uh, as I started working on this, I talked to Ron Grant, uh, he of the damaged eye, and I was talking about how much trouble it was, and Ron designed these boards for me. Uh, 
which are the same thing that we ordered them from China and it took six weeks to get here, but they're really wonderful. They're very, very nice. They're gold and they've got all the, the mass printed on them and everything. Uh, so I got 10 of these because I figured I needed about five and there might be some other curious here in the room who might want to build one. The, this is the part I talked to James about earlier. The downside of this is that, for me, is that when uh, Ron designed these boards, he designed a whole bunch of little uh, bypass caps that are those little tiny surface mount things which I can just barely see, much less solder onto a board. And uh, so talking around, I was told, well, the right way to do that is basically you glue them on with some kind of flux and you melt them in a toaster oven. And that James has done much of this and is an expert. So James, I haven't bought the caps yet, but here's a box for <laughs> cards, which I'd like at some point to send away. With you. I can do all the rest except except those little caps. It turns out, as I found, that those are actually the those little caps. <laughs> Hopefully yeah, they're just one-sided, not... <laughs> yeah, these are okay. just, yeah. <laughs> the bypass, the, the, the signals talk to each other without the signals that are right next to each other. <clears throat> they strike up conversations with each other, so it turns out they are. <coughs> uh, so, uh, just a brief uh, update on this uh, board here. These are, we give you the actual real-life numbers. This is an STM Nucleo 64 F411RE. I also have some of the FO4 REs, the ones that have slightly less memory. 401. 401. Yeah. yeah. yeah thank you. <coughs> and the same code runs on all of them. You just don't have quite the resources. It's got a ARM Cortex M4 processor. It's got a 100 megahertz clock. There's 512k of flash, 128k. That flash, I think, uh, I've used about a quarter of it put on so far. So that seems <coughs> probably more than I can So that's that's not the one with the floating point. Yes. Oh, it is? Yes. Oh, it is. Yes, okay. it's the hardware. Wait, put it out here too. Oh. <coughs> so I decided, okay, I've gotten far enough. I've got this uh, uh, real time multitasking uh, system ported to it, and I now need to put it on a robot. And I was eager to get on with that part of it rather than the building of the robot part. So what I did was I took a robot I already had, which is what you see on the screen here. I can give you, uh, there we go. Uh, this has a, a Ryobi leaf blower mounted on top of it, which is see there's a servo here that it can turn that on and off. And what it does is it was built for the UPRG uh, soda can collective contest. And the other robot I have it does it sort of in the traditional way, which is it goes out, finds the soda can, grabs the soda can, turns around, it drives to the goal, it puts it in the goal, it turns around and scans for the next soda can. So this one used a very different mechanism, which was basically it just stood down at one end of the of the arena and blew all the cans down the other end. So as soon as I demonstrated how easy that was, they of course had to change the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'm working now to, to meet the new rules. Basically in the new rules you can only put one can in at a time. And uh, so what I'm going to do, <clears throat> the, the plan is I'm going to locate the cans like I do and grab them and just rotate toward the goal. As I'm rotating toward the goal, I let the can go and blow it through the goal. So I'll be able to put it through. Uh, oh, so you're, you're going to capture it and I'm gonna, blow it through? I'm going to capture it, but only in order to rotate it. Oh, okay. So it's kind yeah. of like a point I thought for a while about just trying to, if I could locate it, I'd just drive around in the right position. But that's actually harder yeah. than grabbing it and rotating toward the, yeah. the target. So, uh, and the issue, you know, we were taking, I don't know, Doug, it's only, uh, winners were on the order of four or five minutes to collect all six cans. Oh, no, 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 winners. It's like, I want to say Scott can do it in right? under two minutes. Two yeah. minutes or something like that. Yeah. With the, uh, with the uh, leaf blower in its original uh, orientation, I could sit down and clean out the whole thing in about 15 or 20 seconds. <laughs> yeah. So, so the you know rule makers hate innovation. <laughs> <laughs> so my plan was that this uh, 
robot at the time had a, a Motorola MC68332 processor, which I've used on a lot of robots. These two over here both use that uh, same processor. Uh, that's a processor that Motorola developed back in the 90s for the automotive industry is to do well, the stuff that we all do now with the computers in their car. Uh, and it was a 25 megahertz parts and full 32 bit parts, so it was easy to port a bunch of the software to. And uh, the main thing is that it had this uh, a co processor basically, which was a timer counter, 16 channel timer counter, that allowed you to set up all kinds of IO. And that's really what you need on a robot, it's tons of IO. Uh, but it's, what is that, going on 30 year old technology now? <laughs> So I thought, all right, I'll, I'll move into the early years of the 21st century and I'll learn about our processor. So I pulled the, the uh, processor off that. Uh, if, if it's not obvious, this is the same robot without the leaf blower. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, I installed the, uh, the breakout card, the one that I have built uh, <coughs> with the uh, STM32 card on it. And I've begun the process of bringing up all the subsystems. And that's basically uh, what I've done this summer. And my talk is what, what I did on my summer. Vacation. And that's what I'm going to describe today. So um, let's see if I got all that. Without further ado, I need to switch this and be sure this works. David? Yes, sir. There's uh, also a processor there that if you run out of horsepower and I.O., there is a 144-pin version of that. That's the 429. I'll and tell you got, what. And it's got, I don't know, <laughs> four times as much memory or something like that. And run, I, I, I think, faster. based on what I'm doing now, uh, you know, these processors have a, a I believe they have a, 512k flash and 512k RAM. Yeah. And this one's only got 128k. So, but I said that I went through the math and I thought, I think I got everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's also the case that <clears throat> these boards, since they use the same bus, you can take any of their boards and yes. put it into this uh, breakout board. <clears throat> yep. And uh, so that should, that should make it easy. All right, just wanted to be sure we could see the whole thing. Uh, obviously, in the middle here is that STM card, and you can see the, the wires coming off either side from the uh, from the I/O buses. And uh, this is a little button interface, and up there is a, a LCD, a serial LCD. Uh, the last part, well, I can just point here, can't? I? Yeah. Of course I can. Where's <laughs> <laughs> your laser pointer? Uh, this thing here, uh, because this robot was really built. Uh, to have this big leaf blower with its great big battery on it, that was how it was designed to balance. And uh, it doesn't balance without that. So this is a three pound lift weight that I put on when I don't have the leaf blower, just in order to keep it stable. So we'll shove it out. It's an anti Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. So that brings me back to the screen. Got something? Yeah. Yep. Cool. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just uh, as a just a general overview, uh, I use the GCC tool chain, uh, which I've uh, installed on this laptop. I do most of my development on this laptop and on the machine I have uh, at my house. <coughs> I back everything up. And uh, this is uh, Linux. I do everything out of Linux. So. The question Linux developers are often asked is, what IDE do you use? You have to understand that IDE is a term that doesn't mean anything. That's a Windows term. My integrated <laughs> development environment, my integrated development environment is called Linux. <laughs> and so there is no IDE here. Uh, you should point out, the, uh, yes, David, yes. David, that you gave me some portions of your code and we were able to easily put this on Atalic. And you, you can... Atalic. Atalic. You, you can put David's 
some of David's code, which he uses GCC, Vitalik uses the GCC, and so if you prefer to use an IDE that's real, uh, you can, uh, or, you or, can, yeah. Or if you need to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, or if you need to. Right? Yeah. If, you, if you need that crutch. Yes, I do. <laughs> really <laughs> desperately. Help supply. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I need all the help I can get, David. Say again? You're using like make files to get things to compile. Yes. yes. Use make and uh, use their loader. Uh, the way I download to the card itself, there's two different ways to do it. There's a, a open OCD, which basically uh, you set up and it's a daemon that talks to the board and then you connect it with Telnet to issue commands. Uh, it's kind of like a debugger. It's a useful thing. Uh, I found more useful the SD flash commands, which you can use to erase the flash and to download code and so forth. I just found it easy, easy to use, so that's what I use here. All the rest of it, as I say, is just a Linux and a standard uh, tool chain, GCC tool chain. Uh, what we're looking at uh, here, are we looking at anything? Yeah. Uh, and you can see my mouse, right? Yeah. Yep. All right. I'm in a, the directory user local in Linux, which is where you typically install uh, add-on user packages. And you can see here that there's the ARM GCC as installed there. I also have a, an AVR compiler. There's the 68332, which is what these machines use. And uh, last but not least, over here is this thing, the STM cube, which is uh, I'm going to talk about just briefly. This is uh, code that I got from STM. You can go download it off their uh, website. And what they provide basically is a set of uh, drivers that can talk to all the various hardware I have, which is the complicated part of the ARM. The uh, it's highly configurable, which means that even doing simple things require a lot of code. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, even though it's, it's, it's quite powerful. And uh, there's a link there just called STM. You guys will excuse me for shorthands here. Uh, so within that STM cube driver, driver, they give you documentation and drivers and projects and utilities, all those things here. The most useful ones are drivers. And uh, they all, there are some examples there that are used for all useful loss groups. And in the drivers, you have the board support package, then there, CMSIS, which we'll get to in a minute. And then there are handle drivers, and that's what I've ended up using. That's the hardware abstraction layer. And in theory, if you use their hardware abstraction layer to talk to the hardware, they didn't work across their whole line of uh, products. Uh, that's not why I used it. I used it because it's actually pretty powerful. Uh, if you go into that HAL directory, you'll note that there's an include directory and a source directory, and then they have some uh, documentation. And I found that the source directory itself, uh, the, the documentation and the code itself is all I really need to get these things working. And basically, if you look down the list here, you can see they've given you drivers for ADC, uh, there's a CAN bus driver where it's got, there's a CAN bus driver. Uh, they can generate, they can do crypt, uh, cryptographic library, as a DMA. And uh, there's a, I'm going to jump down here into the code. There's uh, two things here that you'll see over and over in this code. The first one is I want to initialize the GPIO pins that we're going to use for this particular function. So there's this uh, procedure here called the uh, UART1 GPIO in it. And you see the very first thing is this long uh, type def called GPIO in it type def. And I, that's the struct. And I make one of those structs and I call it my GPIO uh, GPIO in it struct. That's the struct that they use to initiate uh, the GPIO pins. <coughs> then uh, this line here is a, you have to actually enable the clocks in order to write the registers for the IO. So each time you want to talk to those, and they, the how, you'll see that's in the how command. Uh, we'll do all that for you. So I say enable that clock, and then we set uh, the elements of the struct. And in this case, we told it we want a GPIO, uh, GPIO pin 9 and 10, which I got out of looking up uh, in the manual what pins are available for the USART. And that I want the mode to be what is called alternate function mode. 
uh, this is what <coughs> Dave has some software where you can do this visually. You grab the function and you haul it over to the pin you want, and it will automatically assign the function to the pin. That's the QBMX. The QBMX. So. so this says I want the, uh, the mode for these pins. I want to be alternate function. I want it to be push pull. I don't want any pull-ups. You can have pull-ups or pull-downs on the outputs. Uh, I don't want any pull-ups. I want it to run at fast speed. And the alternate function I want it to use, again, I looked this up in the table, is alternate function 7, which is for USART number 1. Having done all that, I tell it I want it, uh, I call this GPIO init program, and hand it that struct. On those pins, are they, are they like the Arduino or some of them are PWO compatible and some All the above. Uh, all the pins are general purpose, so any of them can be, can be made. Any of them can be a USAR, any of the pins can be a PWM, any of the pins can be a driver. So typically, typically, each pin will have four functions or more that can be directed to that pin. So you may have to select specific pins where you have that PWM function that you want, then select the PWM function to go to that pin, and now you have PWM on the pin. And so basically that's what the GP is. Yeah, general, general purpose. General purpose. Yeah. 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 When they first come out of reset, all the pins are set as, as floating uh, inputs. And so anything else you want to do besides that, you actually have to specifically go in and do it. So I said that <coughs> you can do some really complicated functions by setting up bunches of registers. But it means that to do simple functions, you also have to set up bunches of registers. So in that sense, it's not like an argument that we don't have a lot of the built in functionality. You have to program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Earlier, you had a speed function. Would that have to do with the, uh, the, the current control for the pin? In other words, when it's, time? when it's an output pin, uh, the resolution of it depends on how fast the clock is driving. So depending on what your output function is, you can choose high, medium, or low speed. Okay. You're asking about... I saw my previous slide. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. 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 <clears throat> and fast is the default. So really, it's a way of saving the process of power. I stuck all mine on fast. They probably don't. Yeah, it also uh, in terms of uh, EMI. So, so, it doesn't drive the, so it does drive the pin higher because you're running with a faster clock. Yeah, okay. Very good. Oh, now I do have a question. This is a dumb one. So what's this the value of how okay? I'm sorry? Return what? how okay? Return how okay. Where does that come from? Oh, it's in one of their um, include files. And uh, how okay is the. In other words, zero. all of the things that are in the are defined. Yeah. It's the yeah. value zero. Yeah. 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 Pretty Probably. much everything in uppercase is a, is a constant. All right. So, yeah, as a matter of fact, you'll see in my code that I get tired of doing that, and after a while, I start just returning zero. Zero. Yeah. That is too many extra characters. I'm tired of it, yeah. Yeah. And there is a zero, and there is an O in there, yeah. if you think about it. Oh, we used to do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to uh, set up uh, now the, the UART itself. Now, what we've done is hooked the proper pins and told it which pins to use. And now there's a handle type def, and I just call it UART1. So this is another struct that's uh, the way we're going to talk to the UART, the handle we're going to use to talk to the UART. So again, we do the same thing. I say, OK, the instance is I want it to be what it calls USART1. Set the baud rate, the word length, eight bits, uh, one stop bit, parity. Uh, you set up the mode, and you'll see the one I've commented out said the mode is transmit and receive. <clears throat> but this little LCD doesn't send anything back. So I only need transmit, I don't need receive. So that's why that's commented out. I said the mode is just a UART mode transmit, and that I want no hardware flow control. This is all standard stuff that you do when you set it. So why did you bother with that receive line then if it's setting up this GPIO? I thought at the time that I was going to set up a, oh, okay. a, a general purpose. You're, you're getting ready. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Being careful. You know, just being careful. Now, you might also mention that there's more than one you are known as. About four or five. Right. And you can connect it in different ways. Yes. OK. <coughs> so then, uh, with that struct set up, call the UART init, just like uh, we did for the GPIO, and set up the GPIO pin to the UART init. And this <coughs> processor has a really neat nested vector interrupt controller. Yes. Uh, it's really pretty cool. It's what you normally would associate with the big dog computers. And uh, in this and case, it's your operating system. It, it does. It, it's 
a very, there's a lot there. Uh, in this case, I'm used to doing some very simple things. So I said, uh, <clears throat> I did, again, using the how call, I told it to set the priority for the nest uh, vector interrupt controller uh, for a, a interrupt for that use argument and set the levels for that interrupt. And then I enabled that interrupt. <laughs> so uh, they have a handler. It's automatically, that will automatically do that. And so I just plugged in, I said, take the USART one handler and just pass it off to the HAL handler until it, the USART struck. And then it does all that other stuff for you. Normally you'd have to go in and do that. Line. Finally, they give you, uh, oh, I don't have that here. Let's see, I can pop over here. Uh, they give you a bunch of weak uh, definitions that you can then override. And pretty much all the interrupt vectors are done that way. So here I've overwritten uh, their weak interrupt vector with my own callback. And this is basically when you finish transmitting a character, an interrupt is uh, generating, uh, saying, uh, end of transmission. And you can use that to try to go fetch another character. OK, I'm going to jump ahead to what David said a minute ago. There are actually multiple uh, UARTs on this. And there's another one that you can use. The UART 2 talks to <clears throat> this little USB card, and so you can have a virtual COM port through the USB port, which is kind of a nice thing to have. And so I set that up also, and uh, that's what the second instance is. Use R2 is for that COM port. So basically, this replaces their interrupt, and, and all it does is it uh, goes into the real time queue if there's another character available, it transmits it. If there's not, it disables the interrupt. So that, that's pretty standard. Pretty standard. So at the end of that, then I have uh, a put character and put string command. And this is what the software will actually interact with. And it tests to see if the transmitter is busy. And if it is, it stuffs the character in the queue. Hey, if it's not, it goes ahead and sends the character straight to the transmitter, uh, sets the transmitter busy before it exits. The string command then. <coughs> Just calls that function to be So now, in theory, we should be able to send uh, some ASCII characters out, serial port USR1, and they should show up uh, on the LCD screen. So, since you guys have already seen that the LCD screen does have characters on it, I assume I, I don't have to prove that. <laughs> now, and we'll move on. There's a, a, one other subtle thing I've done, and I, I do this typically. Uh, with the robot systems I have, which is that you can go into the new lib sys calls where the, uh, the write function is and overwrite that write function. And basically what it does is uh, looking at the, the file descriptor for that write function. If the file descriptor is standard out, and I'll send the string to the column, that is to the computer to the virtual column. If it's standard error, then I send it to the LC. That way you can use normal printf commands, printf or fprintf commands, uh, to determine what output goes on this, rather than having special ones. I do have some special ones that you can use this But that's just as a simple solution so that any code you've written that has a printf will automatically go to the console port. If it's got a fprintf to standard error, it'll automatically go. And then that way you don't have to customize the code to, to talk to the else. Do you try using the DMA? I've done some other things with the DMA. I, I did much more with it than I should have. That's because <laughs> I wanted to, to look into that. Uh, and then the last piece of that is, as I mentioned, the, the LMX real-time system includes a set of cues with it that you can use for the process communication. So that's the way we're, we're talking to the LCD. And so uh, in this uh, LCD file, I set up one of those queues, and I have an LCD put character and an LCD put string, which just uses those queues instead. Uh, and with all that done, then I'm able to take the code that I'd already written, and uh, simply by pointing the output at, uh, at standard error, it shows up on the screen. So I don't have to go through and make any changes. Now, this is an LCD. It's a 4 by 20 LCD. So 
So that means you got to do carriage returns every 20 characters, and you got to clear lines, and you have all, all the things that you don't get when you have a real line uh, display. And so there are a group of uh, care, uh, control commands to do that. Uh, turn the LCD on and off, clear the screen, turn the backlight on and off, home the cursor, set the cursor to a certain position, clear a line. And those are just kind of utilities that are needed when you're, when you're talking to an LCD. There's, there's stuff that has to be done. Okay, so this gets me halfway to, a, to getting the user interface working. I now have output. I can look at output on it. LCD screen. So next piece is I need to be able to read my input, which are these little buttons over here. And those are, uh, let's see, do I have a, I can't see here. Uh, yes. Well, I had a picture here. There we go. Okay. The buttons are basically just a resistive ladder with a switch at each uh, at each junction. Why is that funny? I just like your I love your ASCII text. Yeah, good you job. Got really good like commentary. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do this because when I look at this a year from now, I won't remember what I did. That's why I like it so much. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the same boat. This is a the this ARM chip has a 12-bit and a D. And uh, it can have as many channels as you want, basically, depending on how you set up the software. I set it up to have four channels. And one of them is for uh, these switches, and the other one you'll see I have a little knob on there that I can read. So basically what we have is a range from 0 to 4096 that I've broken up into seven segments. And if you look down here, you can see that I actually, uh, since I had my display working, I could actually display those values for each button. And uh, and wrote them down. So the escape button, which you'll see ties this thing directly to ground, that's escape. So its output is zero. And if there are no buttons pressed, you have a pull-up here that pulls it high, so that would be 4096 or 4095. And in between, there's a plus and a minus and a left and a right and an enter. So this is kind of, on all my robots, I have the same interface. There's six buttons. You got left, minus, plus, Left, right, plus, minus, <laughs> get those straight. Um, enter and escape. And the little GUI that I have, that's the interface that it expects. So, and if we jump back over here, uh, there's actually a function called decode button, which reads that and will hand you back a value for each one of those buttons. Basically, what it's looking is the boundaries between those and hands you back uh, a button for each one. So, to get all that to work, you have to make the ADD. <laughs> and now, now it starts to get a little more complicated. Dave asked if I'd done some DMA. I decided I wanted to DMA the, the A to D converted values into memory, which probably doesn't really need to be done. It made this driver a whole lot more complicated. Uh, but I was learning how to do all this. And the, D, the DMA is actually pretty cool, the, the way you can set it up. So, so we'll jump ahead here. I'm going to return uh, four ADC values, uh, and those are the four of them. These are connected to input pins on port C, uh, pins 0, 1, 2, and 3. So that's the first four pins on port 0. And I'm just going to jump through this now that you've seen how this works. Uh, basically, we have a, to set up some GPIO pins as we've done before. And we have to configure them as analog pins. And then we have to set up an ADC struct. And you have to tell the struct all kinds of things. Uh, a prescaler, uh, resolution, uh, what kind of scans you want to do. Well, you can just read down the list here. And you have to fill out every one of those things. You can't leave any of them blank. That's why I was saying doing simple things is complicated. Doing complicated things is actually pretty easy. But the simple things are just as complicated. So. Well, if you want to be lazy, use <laughs> <laughs> MHQ. <laughs> so, uh, it's good to know what all of these do, too, because that way you can, you can alter this page. You were talking about the thousand page. Oh, man. OK, so we fill out that struct, and then you call this ADC init, giving it that handle. And uh, then again, we're going to go to the nested vector interrupt controller and tell it to enable the interrupt for uh, the uh, ADC 
uh, to set its priority and to enable it. Now, this is where it gets complicated. You're going to configure these, uh, each one of these channels, and <clears throat> you have to tell them what order they need to be. That's what rank means. So channel 11 is rank 1, and <clears throat> it's a 56 cycles uh, to complete one sample, and there's no offset, and there's the handle that we set up previously and the channel we set up previously. Now we're going to do that for all four of our channels. And here we're going to configure the DMA, which I'm going to skip over, uh, but which is pretty cool. Uh, maybe I shouldn't skip over it. Uh, so I'm just bursting four, four numbers to memory. It's probably hardly worth the DMA, but I want to learn how to do it. And again, you fill out a uh, struct and you call it an hit. And then you have to link the DMA to whoever's actually driving it, and we have to set up our nested interrupt vector and enable the IRQ. And now we get uh, a callback that just writes our values. So I think that's enough about A to D. We can go on and on. You can see there's quite, there's quite a bit to it. And as I said, I made it more complicated than it was needed because I was trying to learn about the DMA uh, at the time, which is a pretty neat function. There's a lot of things you can do with it. You can read a single port and increment through memory the values of that port, or you can increment the port at the same time you make the memory. There's just lots of things. It's very flexible. It, so. It's really good for uh, the UR, too, because you can just say, just send all this crap over here to this UR. And you take care of it. You take care of it. You have a question? So you, so one of your, so I, saw, I like how you with the buttons. So the buttons are only using one of your A to D hands. <coughs> what are you using other three A to Ds for? One of them is this knob here. Okay. And the other two are uncurrently I have uh, one of them is supposed to be the battery voltage, but I've been handling the battery voltage in a different way. Uh, and as I said, the fact that what I'm using four here is very arbitrary. We, you can have as many as you want. Sure. Uh, I thought four would be enough. Probably six would be better. <laughs> yeah, so, so you don't look for a, a specific resistance value, you look for kind of a, a window or a range, right? Because just a range. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah with uh, <clears throat> I calculate these ranges back here. <clears throat> You'll see here are the values for each button. Yeah. And then there's a, a boundary, okay. which is yeah. actually halfway between each one of these. So if I say right. if it's anywhere in this boundary, that's the escape button. Yeah. If it's anywhere. In so it doesn't likely to hit the exact. Let me uh, <laughs> see, can I make this work? There it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to just do something. I'll explain later what I'm doing, but uh, I'm going to change the display here. So, okay, this is just a little uh, test function, and as you can see uh, that it says, can you see my fingers here? Am I covering that? Yeah. Yeah. that this is a button test, and we're looking at the AD converter, and it's currently telling us that its output is 4095, and it says that's button zero. And so if I push different buttons here, it says uh, that's button three, and it's the minus button. There's button two, the plus button. There's our left button, button four, right button, button five, there's enter, button six, there's escape button one. Okay, so that's basically just a little um, <coughs> reset to exit. <coughs> Oops, sorry. All right. <laughs> okay, so with these two pieces working, uh, working, 
because I have I can talk to the thing and I can read the LCD. I can now get my little user interface working, which is necessary for me to get all the rest of the systems working, in which I want to explain here in, in rough detail, <clears throat> so that it will be obvious uh, what we're doing. Uh, and it really consists of two pieces. There's a, a, a little GUI, a GUI, uh, and there are a couple of menu editors. And basically, I'm just going to run through this real quickly. Here's the, here's the task. It says GUI task. And you'll notice that it's an endless loop, while one loop that doesn't exist. That's one of the indications that this is part of the multitasking system. This will be one of the tasks that's run that concurrently. And if we just jump ahead, you can see basically what we do is we suspend waiting on a button. And then when you get the button, you do a case statement, do a switch there. And whether, depending on what kind of button it is, uh, <clears throat> the, there are various functions that can be done. That's when we're in sort of the, the, main, uh, the main status. Uh, then you can call from that, you can call a second uh, function and what it does is allow you to edit some of the uh, some of the values, and it's the same thing. It sits and waits on a button, and then basically has a switch statement uh, where, it, uh, depending on which button, it has uh, different functions. So, having said that, we jump back over here. I have now to describe uh, something that's a little bit arcane in order to explain what's going on. There's a special. Uh, this this memory all runs on a flash. And so when you hit reset, uh, two things happen. Uh, the reset function, you know, it sets up the, the uh, initial stack pointer, or initial program counter. It cleans the BSS section uh, of memory. That is, it clears that. That's where most of all your variables are kept. So it zeroes all those variables. And then it copies uh, from flash to RAM uh, the read-only memory section. And in this particular implementation, as well as the other ones I have, uh, there is a particular segment of memory, which I call p-data, for parameter data, which is not copied from flash to RAM it's, uh, at reset. It's only copied at power on reset. You can ask to have it copied. The user can ask to have it copied, but it's not automatically reset. And what that means is that you can change those parameters and hit reset, and they, they are <coughs> uh, continuous across the reset. Basically, the way I work with the system is I go into this parameter menu and I set up the parameters I want and I hit reset. It brings the robot up in that particular configuration. So what we're getting ready to look at uh, in the code, any parameter is a small p underscore. Any variable that begins small p underscore means that's part of that parameter block. It's not automatically reloaded when you reset. And uh, in the other two robots, which actually have battery backed RAM, uh, those values even blast across and power off. Uh, on this one, they don't. Uh, when you power on, you have to read, you have to load in the parameters when you power off. Maybe later. <laughs> Maybe we get battery back up there. You can um, use uh, EE prop. Yeah, there's a bunch of kludgy ways to do it. I'd rather just have a. I turned on this little machine here, which doesn't have battery backup. It's got a super cap. And okay. It's been turned off for probably a year. Uh, and I turned it on, and all the parameters were there. Woo! That super cap has held it up for a year. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay, I got to see time over here. I will demonstrate this uh, little interface. You can see the buttons in the display. Okay. This is, uh, what we're looking at is a status display. There are a bunch of different status displays. This particular one is for the odometry. Uh, I think if I turn a wheel, it might even move. You know. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, it, and it's sort of at the top level. And at this point, uh, the buttons have different functions. The one that we're interested in is the escape button. Uh, if it's not clear from the labels, we have uh, left and right, minus and plus. And this is escape and this is enter. So the black uh, button is the enter button. So when you're in the main menu here, if you hit the enter button, it takes you uh, to the second level, which is what I call the flags display. Every uh, system in the robot has an enable flag associated with it, whatever it is, lighting the LEDs, turning the LCD on and off, uh, running the pulse width modulation. Every function has a flag. And here in this particular menu, those flags are all gathered together in one place. 
So by looking at all these ones and zeros, I can tell the whole um, state of the robot with it in, a, in a single place. So you memorize them? I know where they all are, but if you'll note, and we have a whole bunch of ones and zeros, and then the very next line has an ASCII label. Oh, okay. It tells me that the one that's flashing, oh, which is the first one here, is the user. So in this case, right. my left and right uh, buttons actually move across the, the menu. So there, there's the motor <coughs> subsystem, the pulse width modulation. There's a, we'll get back to that one, uh, a rotate function. There's a navigation function. There's avoidance functions. A bumper, IR, Polaroid, sonar, an IMU, a stasis detection, servos. Uh, and I don't have an IMU on this one yet, so those are just dummies. So uh, basically, uh, the back and forth buttons allow you to move back and forth. And then if I use plus and minus buttons, I can set those flags. So for example, I just turned on the Polaroid <coughs> subsystem by setting that flag. If I hit reset now, those of you with good ears should be able to hear the, yeah, hear the sound yeah. coming on. And by the same token, uh, we turn that back off. I set that one back to zero and reset. And we take it back. So that's basically the way the whole system works. Now, each one of these flags has associated with a block of parameters for that particular uh, function, whatever it is. So, um, well, we'll just leave it on the Polaroid function here. If you hit, rather than plus and minus, or left and right, if you hit escape, uh, I'm sorry, enter, uh, you go into the second level of menu uh, editing. And that level is the actual uh, values that are associated with that particular function. In this case, you can see the first one is the Polaroid. It has a delay, which is set at 64. And we can step through. It has a wait time set at 10. It has an enable button, so it only has those three parameters associated with you, uh, with it. And in this case, when you're in here, you can actually edit those parameters. So that's 64. If I say plus and minus, I can make it 72 or whatever, 67 or whatever. Uh, I mentioned that there was a knob associated with the second A to D channel. And if you look down here, it says the knob is currently at 33. The knob will go from plus 1,000 to minus 1,000. And so if we said, well, I'd like <coughs> I'd like the delay to be uh, 525, but I don't want to have to count up to there. I can just hit the enter button and it says, do you want to write the knob? And I say, yes. And so it'll write that value. There is another function where I can turn on, no, I'll just demonstrate. Uh, go back down here to, uh, to the user menu. And uh, that's where I was setting the displays. And I'm going to say I want to enable a knob. This is an automatic function. Uh, and now if we go back up to, uh, we can just choose anything. I'll tell you what, we go into the motor controller. And the motor controller velocity is currently set to 300. So I could set it to something, like I could set it to 521. But if I, now that the knob is enabled, when I say I want to copy the knob over, it says, do you want to connect the knob? And if I say yes, now we have, you can see both of those numbers are changing in real time. So you can hook that up, and then in, when you exit, it will maintain its connection. So for example, I, I can turn it on and run around on the floor and speed it up and slow it down by turning that. You can hook that knob up to any uh, parameter in the thing. So I'm going to now disconnect it. Oops. Is there anything else about that? So you have basically two menus where you can edit. You can edit the flags menu to turn subsystems on and off, and you can go to the particular subsystem and edit the values within those. When you hit reset, what you've added <coughs> remains. It doesn't change. The BSS said it is <coughs> Any questions about that? This is just my own little oddity, but I wanted to explain how it works because it's necessary when we start looking at the other subsystems. This good? We're good? It's good, yeah. All right. I do with my coffee. Dave, and, just, and can you just, I'm not sure I understand how you keep this over a reset. How did you, you, you mentioned it, but I'm, I guess I didn't catch something. Okay, in the, in the startup code, uh, if 
if you're familiar with C, that's usually called C root, but CRT uh, .o, it's almost always written in assembly. Okay. So, and that startup code uh, for all C compilers pretty much does the same thing. It sets the stack pointer and program counter, and it clears memory, uh, the BSS segment, and it copies the read-only segment from flash into RAM. <coughs> Right? Okay. There is a, another read-only segment called <clears throat> the parameter data set, one that I set up that does not get copied over unless you specifically ask for it. Okay. And as a matter of fact, any anytime you're in the main menu, if I hit the escape button, you see it says, do you want to reload the parameters? And it's asking you to push the plus button. If I don't push the plus button, it beeps at me. But if I do push the plus button, it goes in and reloads those parameters. So it, is, uh, it does it on power on startup. It loads them in always on power on startup. But any other reset, it does not load those parameters in. So yeah, when you change the ones in RAM, <clears throat> they don't get overridden. Yeah, there are bits in there that you can tell what's caused the reset. Was it a power reset or was it a, a button reset? Or was it a socket reset? Yeah. So in the old days, we used to call these cold and warm resets, or hard and soft resets. Yeah. Where okay. a hard reset means you really are resetting everything. Resetting so you're really not, otherwise if you disconnect your battery, you go to your default parts, whatever they are. Yes. Okay. Yeah, when I'm powering the thing down, uh, <clears throat> those are lost because I don't have battery yeah. back here. So when I turn it on, you'll notice that it will ask you. It says, do you want to reload? And the reason that's there is because when I'm developing code, sometimes you download something and when you try to initialize, it crashes. And so it's very difficult to debug because you can't get the system to run. So if, when you come up out of power on reset, if you hold down this little blue button right here, it zeroes all the flags so that no functions are running and you can go back in and turn them on one by one and find out which one's going to crash. Okay, so you, you have um, a lot of things in Flash and you said you, on, you know, applying battery voltage or whatever, I guess power to the processor, you transfer some of those variables into RAM. But when you, when you change them and you do a reset, you're not resetting the processor, you're just updating those values in RAM, right? No. No? Totally. Just exactly backwards. Backwards. When you do a reset, <clears throat> you're resetting everything. It's a real life hardware reset. Okay. All, yeah. all of the registers are reset, all of the hardware is reset, memory is cleared, and uh, values are copied from flash into RAM, except for this P date set. Okay. It is not copied from the flash into RAM except on power on reset or right. when you ask for it. Right. But if you change parameters and then um, you wanted those to be stored or, well, I guess it's not, they're not permanently stored, right? No. So they'd have to be no, the flash. That's what I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And um, maybe I can demonstrate this here if I... No, that's okay. I, I, I think did, I understand. Follow up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> All right. To figure out how to do it. Okay, so I've got buttons, I've got an LCD, I've got the little GUI and menu, now I'm ready to start actually building the parts necessary to make the robot work. And I'm going to uh, stop and talk a little bit about subsumption since that's what this talk was supposed to be about. Uh, but I have one other uh, uh, hardware layer I want to look at first, which is the motor controllers. So the very next thing, now that I can push buttons and beep beepers and look at output on the LCD, uh, was to be able to drive the, the motors. 
Now, this particular robot has a DevonTech. Uh, well, I should take that back and show these things. To help you get it back in the right spot. Uh, I've got a pair of uh, Pittman motors. Those have, uh, I believe, a 20 to 1 gear head on them, on the front of them. They're 24 volt motors. They have uh, encoders on the back end that do uh, 500 counts per resolution. You should have done that monitor. We could see it better. Well, that's not a bad idea, John. <laughs> I need a manual. <laughs> My eyes can't see that little spot right now. Well, so. So, so, as best you can see, this is a, a 3,000 uh, milliamp hour uh, battery. Uh, and is there anything else you need to know there? No. Oh, yes. Uh, this controller here is much ballsier controller than this little robot needs. It's just one that I happen to have. It's a, a DevonTech uh, MD22. And the DevonTech you can talk to, it's a dual motor controller, so it's controlling each, each of those sides. It's driven off 24 volts and uh, controlled from a couple of pins on this uh, processor. Uh, and these switches here allow you to talk, to set how do you want the interface to talk. And this particular one is set up, because the previous one was, uh, to talk standard RC pulses. There's a lot of ways you can talk to uh, motor controllers. You can use I2C, you need some of them to talk to serial. Um, some of them you generate a pulse and send uh, <coughs> directional bits. Uh, and I actually have all those different drivers available. But the one that I determined to use here, <coughs> the right spot, it's actually close. OK. The ones I determined to use here are for the radio controlled servo pulses. And just happen to have a, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, the radio controlled servo pulses uh, are pulses that last uh, I should drop down, uh, from uh, one millisecond to two milliseconds. And so that would be one millisecond, and that would be two milliseconds. Milliseconds. Uh, and uh, typically, on a typical servo, uh, <clears throat> what that means here's your servo, and here's its output arm, and that arm can swing through 90 degrees. <clears throat> and when you are at one millisecond, you're at one end of that, and when you're at two milliseconds, you're at the other end of that. So, this is a pulse train. Uh, for historical reasons, these pulses were uh, 60 milliseconds apart. So there were 66 of them uh, per second. Uh, some uh, modern ones, you can drive right to them a whole lot faster than that. Uh, if some traditional servos, if you try to ride faster than that, you'll, you'll see that they jitter. They're not happy getting their update that fast. So if you have a jittering servo, go back in and lengthen this time and see if that doesn't go away. Uh, there is one other. Uh, optional change to this, which is that most servos can go more than 90 degrees. And uh, a lot of modern servos, cheap off-the-shelf modern servos, can go 180 degrees. So, yeah, we'll do it this way. And in order to go 180 degrees, essentially what you have to do is give it a larger signal than this. And it's a signal that goes from 0.5 milliseconds to 2.5 milliseconds. So if you have a servo that can handle it, you can send it this uh, wider range, and you can your servo will rotate all the way to 180 degrees. That, that's actually pretty common. For our motor controller, uh, it doesn't want to see anything lower than one millisecond or higher than two milliseconds. Uh, there's no real servo arm or anything. Here, but we'll, we'll have to limit uh, the range to that. Any questions about that? Does it do, um, you know, can it receive the encoder um, outputs and do, you know, PID control within the board? Or well, do you want to give this talk? Well, no, I was just wondering. <laughs> Does it do that? Yes. Yes. Does some, some do some? Yeah. Uh, I'm doing that in a different way here. Okay. Uh, the, uh, what uh, <clears throat> was being suggested here, there are some of these controllers that you can actually uh, give encoder feedback to, and they have built in. Uh, proportional integral derivative uh, functions that all built into the same uh, board. This one doesn't have it. This one is not set up that way. So I'll do that part. I'll do that part by hand. Just for a point, 
the polo versions of the jerk jerk motor controllers. J J R. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. they we actually gave one as a prize out. You know who got it? No. Scott. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> what were you saying about pitch controls and what uh, pitch control built onto the board? Is that what you meant? Built yes. into the motor controller. Yeah. Um, this, this some do. This one doesn't, but some of them do. Yeah. Robocalls do. Uh, so but now you can just include a pit library, though. And oh, yeah. The toy and that, and that's, what we're, that's what we're going to do. Oh, yeah. <coughs> so, uh, are we going to ask about the boat? Yeah. That's off the shelf modem and the gear. Oh, you would ask that. I cheated a little bit. Those uh, those motors came with a different gearbox on them, and so I machined uh, uh, an adapter so I could put these these gearboxes on them. But those are uh, Tanner's, Tanner's always has Pitman motors. And here's my advice: whether you're building a robot or even have any ideas for one, if you go in Tanner's and they've got some Pitman motors back there, go ahead and buy them because. You know, these motors were, I don't know, the ones on this robot were three, four hundred dollars a piece, new. Easily. And I got them for like 20 bucks a piece over the counters. Mm -hmm. So, and also you're going to need spare spare parts. So, if you find that he has some, buy all the ones he has. At least buy three. Uh, because it is, it is surplus, and the next time you go in there, you may not have He won't have them, and he'll never, he'll never see them. That's right. Go ahead and see them. So, I was reading online that turn a, you were talking about the servo angles, you know that you can take a, like a 180 degree servo and make it continuous rotation? Wait, yeah, that's pretty standard on the little robots they use those to drive the wheels. Right. Basically, buy them that way. Yeah. Hey, I still got more code to go, and that's just one. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's coming back. <laughs> <up. laughs> uh, You're just wearing everybody's bladder out, Dave, not no, 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 no. <laughs> But it's my turn, okay. <laughs> So what we're going to do is uh, generate a, uh, a pair of signals that can do pulse width modulation that I can use to control this uh, Devon Tank speed controller, which we can then use to control the motors. And uh, that turns out uh, that there's a function to do that, as you might expect, and it's actually not that hard to do. Um, so here is a... a it's not on your screen yet. Oh, oh. oh I didn't push the right button. Thank you, Dave. Maybe. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so here's a piece of code called servo.c, and what it's going to do is generate four servo pulses, because I decided I wanted to have four of them. And basically, it's the same thing we've done before. They have timer functions, and those timer functions can do all kinds of things. And one of the things they can do is they can generate servo pulses. So it's not, it's not that hard to generate. So here I have a timer function, and you have to set up a, a prescaler and what you want the period to be. And I think back up here somewhere, I calculated the period, yeah. The timer pr frequency for this particular clock is 4 megahertz. And so I wanted to have a 16.6 uh, millisecond period. Uh, and so uh, that's calculated. It turns out that that's just one rollover in the 16-bit counter at 4 megahertz, which is awfully handy. And then I needed to define what one millisecond is, since we're going to have pulses that vary to two milliseconds. So we set up a, a handle uh, for that timer and uh, for our uh, GPIO pins, which of course have to be configured. And uh, we set that timer up. I tell it I want it to uh, uh, have a certain period uh, divided by that prescaler, and I want it to, to count up. And then I start that, that timer. That's time, timer is just free running. I start that. And each one of these uh, timers has what's called an output compare function, which you can do something when it matches a compare. And so I said, all right, what you want to do is I want you to reset on match. And uh, I want, you see here, it says, what is the mode? The mode is output compare pulse width modulation. So that's, that's the function that's built in. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, I especially like this one, since I read this out of uh, somebody else's example. And the comment is, what does this do? <laughs> so OC fast disable. We got the ARM experts in here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it works. And then uh, we're going to have an initial uh, duty cycle of uh, right in the center of our range, which would be uh, one and a half milliseconds. So I say the center is one millisecond plus one millisecond over two. 
that's the timing for our setting. And then we're going to have four of those channels, so I have to configure each one of the channels. Uh, and then we have to configure the I.O. pins, because they're all the alternate functions, the same thing we've done before. Finally, I have a servo uh, init code, which calls each one of those in turn, and then starts the, the PWM on each channel. So, so say, if you think about that compared to what you have to do in Arduino to set up a PWM channel, there's, there's a shitload of stuff here. <laughs> uh, however, once you have all that set up, uh, it's very easy to talk to the thing. And there's a, a function here called servo, and you give it the channel and the duty cycle. And I'll explain the duty cycles here. And the normal duty cycle would be from 0 to 100%. Uh, because of the way I do resolution on these robots, I, I use 1,000 uh, higher resolution. So to rotate through 90 degrees or to talk to our controller, we go. We need to go from zero to 1,000. But if you want to put a servo on here and rotate through 180 degrees, you need to be able to go from minus 500 to 1,500. So this uh, this servo controller will actually accept those values as valid. Uh, we'll have to be careful in our software that we don't get it invalid numbers before that. So. Uh, we call the servo function, the first thing it does is I have a utility called clip, which just keeps things within bounds. And so I say clip that so it can't be below five, minus 500 or above 1500. And then the duty cycle is equal to one millisecond times that duty cycle divided by 1000 plus one millisecond. That gives you the necessary delay. And then I just stuff that delay uh, into a register on the timer. I have a note down here, it says, they actually give you a call to do that, uh, as you might expect, rather than just stuffing it into the register. But I looked at the call, and there's a whole bunch of steps to it. And I thought, no, oh, that's a lot of steps just to poke a number into a register. I think I'll just poke it directly in. However, what I did was make this code not portable. If you need to use another timer, you have to go in there and poke it into a different register. So I made a note to myself, so when I change the timer and it doesn't work anymore, I can go back and find the note and go, aha. <laughs> That's not correct. All right, having, a, having built this, this uses four, four of the I.O. pins. So uh, I have to drive at least uh, one servo in order to switch the blower on and off. And well, I might want another one for something. Who knows? I'm thinking about putting a gripper on the, on the front of the thing. So the other two channels of, of that are uh, channel one and two are going to be used to drive our motor controller. So in order to make that work, we need a you see all the way to the end? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you see I defined left motor as servo 1 and right motor as servo 2. Now remember our servo values, our motor values can only go from 0 to 1,000. So we have to rescale those before we... Uh, oh, next. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. I'll be there before too long. Back. <laughs> and uh, this is the interface that the rest of the robot uses to talk to the motor controllers. There's a command called pulse width modulation left and pulse width modulation right, which expects a duty cycle. And one of them runs the left motor and one runs the right. So we're going to clip that duty cycle between minus 1,000 and plus 1,000. Now stop. Earlier I said they had to go between 0 and 1,000. What's that minus 1,000 doing in here? Basically, when you drive a motor controller from the servo, the servo is in its center position. That would be one and a half milliseconds. That's when the motor is off. When it's in its maximum position, that's full speed forward. When it's in its minimum position, that's full speed backwards. So uh, one millisecond would be full speed backwards. One and a half milliseconds would be stopped. And two milliseconds would be full speed forward. So for ease of controlling the thing, uh, the way I specify it is that the motors are controlled from minus 1,000 to plus 1,000, where minus 1,000 is full speed back and plus 1,000 is full speed forward. Zero is stopped. So the first thing we do is flip that duty cycle to plus or minus 1,000. And then we have to scale it. So divide it by 2 and add 500. So a range of 2,000 becomes a range of 1,000. It gets scooted up to 500. Now we're going from 0 to 1,000. And 0 becomes the center of of the range. And so I have one of those for left and right. There's one here that actually doesn't get used. It, that is just a simplification to drive both of them. Okay, so now basically, and we'll get back to this, basically these two commands here 
<coughs> are the way that the motors are controlled. The subsumption controller I'm going to describe today uh, just controls motor speed. It doesn't do anything else. So uh, when you build a, subs a subsumption controller, is in some ways you can think of it as kind of like a PID controller. It's a control mechanism that can be used in different places to do different things. And we're going to use it to control the speed of the motor. And we'll do that through these left and right controls. OK, so now we can write. Uh, I was going to demo this, but I think I'm going to jump on the head, so this, is, this won't take all day. Uh, the next piece we need is we've got to be able to read the encoders uh, on those motors. And once again, it turns out that uh, there's a function built in to, do, to read clock encoders built into that. And I'm using a timer 2 for uh, the left side and timer 4 for the right side. And here we have the same basic setup. You generate a structure. You fill the structure with values telling you what kind of timer you want, just like we did with PWM. <coughs> then uh, we enable this, uh, excuse me, we enable this uh, function uh, that tells it that we want it to uh, look at rising input edges on certain pins and so forth and run its uh, quad function. And uh, there we uh, set up our GPIO pins like we did before. We overwrite our weak interrupt uh, routines like we did before. And it ends with a function here that's, uh, that initializes the encoders. Uh, does everybody in here know what a quad encoder is? Am I jumping ahead too far? Is that a yes or a no? Yes. 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 All right. I won't give my misses a wire speech. Uh, and so now they're, uh, so we have these two timers running, and they're, they're generating these quad encoders uh, values by themselves. Once you set it up, you don't have to interfere with that anymore. And there are uh, three little functions here. Read the encoder, uh, write the encoder, and clear the encoder. Uh, and again, uh, I'm just stuffing numbers directly into the timer registers uh, like I did before. There are <coughs> how calls you can do that does all that in a hardware independent way, but, but I decided not to do that. <coughs> um, so what this gives us basically is when you, uh, and we'll, we'll set it up again. <coughs> when you um, initialize those, when the encoders move, there's a pair of quadrature signals that are out of uh, 90 degrees out of phase with each other, so it knows both the direction and how many counts it were. We need more than just counts. We'd like to actually know velocity. And so I get to that in a minute. Uh, User interface. I'm going to tell it that I want uh, I want the dis whoops I want the display to be where are they? the encoders. And so we have a encoder left and an encoder right, and each one let's uh, reset to clear those out. So if I reach over here and I grab this wheel and I turn it. You can see the encoder counting up. And it counts up a lot. <clears throat> okay, I have uh, about 3,000 counts per inch. Uh, there's, uh, <laughs> I will, we'll get back to that. And you can okay, here's the left one. And if I go backwards, we get negative numbers. Can you all see that? Yeah. Look forward yeah. and take it back to zero. Okay, and so. It gives you the velocity. With velocity. Yeah, is, okay. Are you using that for the odometry as well? Yes. So, uh, jump back here to the screen. Like this wasn't really designed as a user interact thing to go push this button here. Hey, it's better than what we could do before, right? <laughs> <laughs> Next time is split screen. Yeah, I'd love to be able to do split screen, but I don't know exactly. Teleconference in, I can be home in my bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there are two other functions here included in the encoder file um, that call this function uh, read encoders. If you look, what I'm going to do is I've got uh, a left, uh, left velocity and a right velocity, which is what Dave was observing. And so I must uh, set the left velocity, I'm going to read the encoder, and then I'm going to clear the encoder. And the total encoder counts is just their current value plus whatever we just read. We'll do that for left and right. 
<laughs> and using that and sampling it at a regular interval, we can get a speedometer. And basically, that's what we were looking at here. We look at the coder counts and the speedometer. In addition to that, there's something I call a speed monitor, which is a long-term running average of the left and right speed of the motor. That turns out to be useful for various high-level functions to know not just what the instantaneous speed of any particular wheel is, but what the average speed is it's for about a second and a half when I say long-term. Uh, I run my update rate here at about 25 hertz. I think that's true. No, 40 hertz. <laughs> and, uh, and so we'll sample those uh, in the speed, speed monitor. No, that's right. 20, about 25 hertz, 40 milliseconds. Uh, you reset them so frequently so they don't roll over. Uh, in the old days, I did, but you know, with this one, I don't think they'd roll over. Uh, but to, to do the speedometer, you need to know how many ticks have elapsed in a given fixed period of time. So I actually run that uh, from an interrupt where it's absolutely regular. And uh, I believe that interrupt, uh, we, we can look up. Oh, here it is right here. Yes. Wait for 40 milliseconds, 25 hertz. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, this little piece of code here, as it says, is run from a one kilohertz user interrupt, and it has a wait time. And so it counts down that wait time, and then it executes. And in that uh, function, it uh, executes at uh, 25 hertz. So we uh, read that, and we run our speedometer, and we reset that. And we'll, uh, I can get in to show you where that where that comes from. Uh, and in that case, I've got to put this up on a little box here, so we'll actually run off the table. Tell me when we're there. Yeah, we go. Yeah, there we go. Can you see it? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see if I can just make the motor run here. Or not. Okay. And you can see that the uh, the cover ticks are ticking off pretty fast, but with the speed we're currently going is about 1,700, 1,800 ticks per sample. So that's our velocity. <laughs> And uh, that should, if I kill this, you should see that drop to zero. Yes. But it didn't. <laughs> Surprised it didn't. But your encoder counts aren't, I thought you were resetting them back to zero, but they are. There is a total number of counts. I don't okay. you can see that. that there's the accumulated counts. Okay. And then there's also the velocity. So, and the accumulated number is, is kept as a running. So, yeah, there, are, there, is, there are a lot of good coder checks, and my general uh, observation is that it's better to have too many than not. Uh, yes. in, in terms, of, as I say, I've got, uh, I think it works out to about 3,000 uh, per inch. Um, okay, what we got? We've got buttons, we've got a user interface, we've got a real time operating system. We can now generate uh, pulse width. RC style pulse width modulation, send to the motor controller and read back the encoders and see the values. So the last piece that we need to look at here before we get to talk about this assumption is the motor controller itself. Anything there yet? No. no. There we go. Okay. So here's a file called motor control and the, the, an important piece of this file are these two values right here and I want to spend a moment talking about this. They're called bot speed and bot rotate. The higher level functions that control the robot do not in point of fact specify a left and a right wheel velocity. They never specify the wheels individually. Rather they specify a speed at the center of the robot and a rotational velocity around so, uh, demonstrate that here. If we picture our, here's our robot, some wheels. This point right here is the point that we're actually specifying. So, if I say I want to go forward at a speed of 500 and I want to turn right at a speed of 20 or whatever, both of those are specified around the center. All the odometry is also calculated from the center of the robot, so that makes certain, certain things clear. 
So you specify not in terms of left wheel and right wheel, but in terms of velocity and rotation, speed and steering. And what we're going to do with those values, uh, we have this little piece of code called motor command. And we say our left wheel is equal to the speed plus the rotation. And our right wheel is equal to the speed minus the rotation. So let's look at an example. If I said the speed is 100 and the rotation is 20, that means the left wheel would be going 120, the right wheel would be going 80, and we'd be turning to the right. So positive rotations turn to the right, negative rotations turn to the left. And there's some real good reasons for controlling the robot this way rather than specifically saying left and right wheel. One of them is that never specific, well, I'll give an example. If you're driving uh, the robot where you're uh, driving in a, an arc, and you tighten that arc up tighter and tighter and tighter until you're essentially spinning in place. Somewhere along the line, the inside wheel gets slower and slower and slower and came to a stop and then started going backwards. To spin in place, one of the wheels has to go backwards. You never specifically told that wheel to go backwards. You just told it the rotation rate. It figured out whether or not it had to go backwards. It greatly simplifies the control software if you talk in terms of speed and rotation rather than in terms of left and right. So that's the first thing this, um, this motor controller does. It comes up with a left wheel and a right wheel value, which are the speed and the rotation combined in this way. Once again, we're going to clip to be sure we don't overflow the minimum and maximum PWM values. And then there's a line that says, remember anything that begins with a P is a, is a parameter that a user can change. If the PID is enabled, then we want to set the right wheel equal to the PID's version of what right wheel should be and the left wheel to the PID's version. And then finally, if the motor is enabled and PWM is running, we're going to call those two commands we had, PWM left and PWM right, in order to set the two values. This is, there's a couple of places in the code where you, where you execute these values, mostly just to set them to zero. But for the most part, they're always set through this function here. Uh, we can jump on down. Here's the PID controllers. There's just a separate PID controller for each uh, wheel. And it's just the standard little PID controller. We're set up to reset that. There's some other things down here that are slew rate generators that allow you to generate ramps. I'm not going to go into that today because it's, it's a whole field by itself. Uh, but that's basically now we have all the pieces we need to, to actually put together the motor controller subsumption. We can talk to the uh, motor controller. We can read back what the wheels are actually doing. We've got a PID running in there. And we, it might be useful just for those who might have a question. I'll pull this over here so you can't see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, what I'm going to do is go into the motor controller. And we'll start with the, with the pit disabled. Uh, and I'm going to turn the speed way down. Yeah. Well, you 
know, with the pit controller off, I was trying to demonstrate that it would run really slowly with the pit controller off. But <laughs> it does run really slow. Really slow. <laughs> Zero is about as slow as you can get. <coughs> well, maybe it'd be uh, more obvious if I just uh, grabbed it and held it by hand. Yeah, measure that spoon five. Geological time. Geological time. So, yeah. basically, with the pit controller off, I can grab this wheel and stop it. But with the pit controller on, which I just turned it back on right now. When I try to stop the wheel, it actually generates, you know, it'll go up to its full uh, range. And so that's more obvious, as I say, I can't seem to get it to drive slow here. Let me turn it one more time. That's more obvious when it's driving real slow. see here, but you can see when I grab a hold of it, when I let go, it actually has to slow down for me because it's ramped up. So what that allows it to do, for example, is even when it's driving real slow, it can ramp up and, and drive over. Uh, the pit controller is the slower you drive, the more powerful. Was that useful or did I just waste time there? <laughs> there's definitely a, a, a fair, fair delay because it didn't immediately just go up over your hand. It delayed and then it cranked it up and then it went up over your hand and it, cranked, and it took a while to crank down again. Right. And uh, as a matter of fact, when you grab a hold of it, that's real obvious because you, know, you, you hold it and it starts pulling harder and harder and harder and you let go of it. Slow back down. Those time constants are the time constants of the bit controller. Yeah, so again, that's change the proportional and that would be, that's how you change that, right? I mean, that's well, the proportional, they're, and this one is not really a PID controller, it's really a PD controller, so it's just a proportional derivative. And basically you want to try to keep the proportion small so that it doesn't overshoot, and you can even use the derivative to damage the behavior. But that's sort of like how much salt is enough. You know, everybody that does it differently. So do you want your robot to be really, you know, it's robotic? And then yeah. do you want it to be more graceful? Well, I, I just didn't know was talking about the... It's also power, too, I mean, more latency you're using. Yeah. Yes, that's why I would adjust the cost. Say P I or P D? P D. P D. Yes, yeah. yeah. Let me get rid of the damn thing. That's one of those constants you had up earlier that you loaded in for each of those little pieces. Yeah, let's see, which one are we looking at here? Tell me when I'm on the screen. There we go. Okay. So if we, uh, we go into our menu here, and you notice I'm on the motor flag. We go in, well, there's a, a velocity for the motor, a rotational value, and there's a PID enable, and there's a slew enable, which is something we're not going to get into. And there is the proportional value, which is going to be 15, and there's the derivative value, which is going to be 5. So you can actually play with that. Basically, when I get it the way I want it, then I go back and stick it in the code. All right. I think that's all I need to talk about with motor controllers. Um, I have notes here to talk about open and closed loop. I think uh, most of you all understand those concepts. We'll skip on ahead to the subsumption part, which is actually Okay, what is subsumption? Subsumption is a control mechanism in which you have various behaviors that are arranged in order of their uh, priority. And at any given, they all run continuously, and at any given time, whichever one has the highest priority is the one that has control. It's a really simple idea. You can do it with just some if statements. If this function, if this function. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to stop for a minute and make a philosophical point about how complex behaviors can arise out of very, very simple uh, algorithms. And I'm going to start with uh, when 
one of these pictures here somewhere. Screwing it up. There. All right. Who recognizes this equation? <laughs> says Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot equation. What? <laughs> Mandelbrot. Did you read that off of the? Of course. Yes. Z equals z squared plus c. Is anybody in here familiar with that equation? Okay, well, I, I should explain that it's actually a little more complicated than it works because z is a complex number. But other than that, the whole Mandelbrot set, and this is a, a key piece of the modern day understanding of, of chaos theory and turbulence and so forth. It's the, and this was a work he did, uh, and his team did back in the 60s. So it's a very, very simple equation z equals e squared plus c. But if you enter at that, that equation, uh, you get things that look like this. <coughs> Probably familiar with, uh, which is incredibly complex and would be very difficult to look at that and know that it was derived from such a simple uh, algorithm. Let's see if I got any other pictures. There's a fun one. Uh, there's the whole mountain of set if you're, if you're familiar with. It. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here with these pretty pictures is just get a little pause and have some pretty pictures. Distract uh, us. Yeah is that uh, complexity can arise from very, very... Normally, when you think about a robot doing a complex task, you think about a prop complex algorithm. You know, beginning robot builders always want to build a robot that will fetch them a beer. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, after a while, they give up on that book. So they... Seems <laughs> <laughs> like a good idea to me. <laughs> Increasing the rates of alcoholism. Uh, the best one I saw was the, the beer launcher. Remember that one? It's, it's oh, a, yeah. It was yeah. a freezer chest with this thing on the side of it that it loaded like a, and you have like a it. weapon. It's like the carbine, and you had a remote. You could sit across the room and hit the remote. It would shoot you over. The, the flip side of that, I should say, is that uh, I've been building robots for about 30 years. And my general observation would be that if complex behavior require complex programming, then we're not going to get there. It's too hard. The, the number of edge cases are too large. Uh, but there is another approach. Don't give up hope. There is another approach. So that's uh, today I want to describe uh, the, a brief uh, subsumption engine that drives the motor controllers that we just looked at. Now that we've seen all of these in the requirement get there. And we're going to start with a very, very simple task. So we're going to have a bunch of tasks that all run and then basically vote on what the computer could do. And that task is called problem. And uh, each, uh, in this particular version of subsumption, this is a, a, a flavor of subsumption called continuous message subsumption. And what continuous message means is that when you have a task that wants to control the robot, suppose you want the robot to back up, you don't send it a single backup command, but rather you send it a continuous stream of messages telling you to back up until you don't want it to back up anymore. That's continuous message. The advantage of continuous message is that those messages can change. For example, you could decelerate by the backup uh, or whatever you want to do. So a continuous message means that each task is going to come up with what it thinks the robot ought to do, and then it's going to try to send that task that those uh, commands repeated uh, to the robot. In this case, this is, uh, in our subsumption architecture, this task is the lowest level one. Actually, the, so this is priority one. The lowest level. There's actually one below that, which is just the robot sitting there stopped like it is right now. But with subsumption running, this is the lowest level. Each one of these tasks has uh, three outputs associated with it. Uh, there is a flag that says whether or not you want to control the robot. There is a command, which is what you want the robot to do, and there is an argument that goes along with that command. For our purposes, the command is the velocity and the argument is the rotation. So each task has got to set a velocity or rotation and then set a flag that says whether or not it wants to control the robot. 
since this is our lowest level task, it always wants to control the robot. And so if we look here, it gives us two options. Uh, command and argument can be zero, or command and argument can be those values we just looked at uh, that are set by the user, the velocity of rotation. And then it sets the flag, it asserts its flag. I have to explain a couple of technical things here. Uh, originally, when I first designed these, I had a struct for each uh, one of these tasks that has the command and the argument and the flag in it. But I found that it was a whole lot more useful to put all the flags together so that you could have the whole uh, in, in one, basically in one integer, the whole state of the machine. So those were moved into a variable called bot flags, and you assert those by doing uh, an or, and you deassert them by doing an and. So you have to set a bit in that, in that flag. Uh, and there's a couple other things in here. So we have uh, an integer, we have the flags, we have the enables, and we have a suppress value, which is a fancy way for tasks to prevent other tasks from running. They can suppress each other. A good example of that might be when you're pulling up on a target uh, waypoint, uh, you don't want uh, an IR reflection to push you away from that. So you might suppress the IR just as you pull it up so that you actually have to hit something. And we have in this particular machine, at, at this particular time, uh, we've got seven uh, layers in this assumption engine. We have the one we just looked at, the lowest layer, which is Prowl. We have a Navigate, Sonar, IR, Rotate, Stasis, which involves the IMU, in which I don't have and bump, which is the highest priority. The bump is the highest priority. So, jump back over here. This task will run along with all the other tasks, and they're not much here. All it's doing is set the set values, the same value over and over again. But it's going to run only when, since it's the lowest priority, it will run only when no other tasks want to control the robot. So, when nothing else wants to control the robot, we're going to try to <coughs> make a motor match the values that, that the user put in for velocity computation. So we'll jump over here and we look at the actual subsumption loop. And we'll get back to this in a moment. Uh, basically, uh, there's a global flag called arbitrate. And when that flag is non-zero, you are arbitrary. When it's uh, zero, you're not arbitrary. That's what I was pushing the button over here. I was setting arbitrate to one. Did you ask about that? And when I made it stop, I said arbitrate back to zero. I can do that from, from the user button. So we're going to run some odometers to determine the robot position. And we run our prowl task, and a navigate task, and a bump task, and an iron task. These are almost all of the state machines. Each one of the tasks is a little state machine. And that's how it makes its decision about what to do. And it ends with something called a, an arbitrator, an arbiter. And the arbiter is the, this, this will take us back to the code we've already looked at. So let's look at the arbiter. And basically what it does when it runs, it tests to see if we're arbitrary. And it's going to load in that suppress with our bot flag. So we know whichever flags are set, and we can just reset those if we're suppressing them. And then we step from the highest priority to the lowest priority, looking for one of those flags that's set. And when we find one that's set, we set it as the winner, and then ignore this slew stuff. And then we pass bot speed and bot rotate. We pass those in from its command and its argument. So whoever won that time around uh, will have its arguments passed along. Since this is continuous message and we're running at 25 hertz, it'll have that message passed along 25 times per second. We jump back over here at the bottom. And once again, this is an endless loop, so it's a multicast. It calls this function period. And what period does is it calculates the, uh, how much time is left over after running all this, and it just delays for that amount of time. So we stay running at an exact rate. And these run very fast. There's lots of time. There's more time left over than there is time spent executing. So, so what your what your duty cycle are? I mean, well, how long does it typically take to run this? I'm talking like one millisecond, ten milliseconds for this thing to run. This this whole loop here runs at 25 hertz. Okay. But the tasks within it probably run in well, probably uh, microsecond. Yeah, micro. Okay. Well, you right. know, I mean, like that subsumption of that prowl task, you know, there's nothing yeah. there. You know. So uh, the, the time mm -hmm. it really has more to do with how long it takes you to collect information. <clears throat> how long does it take you to collect information? 
code information and some other information. David, yes. uh, one question. So, how do you? So let's say you have a, a, a bumper function, all right? And the bumper function is back up a little bit and turn or something like that. But let's just keep it simple, back up and turn. Now, when you hit this, and since it's number one priority, the bumper goes. But one cycle later, you know, one way through the loop, one 25th of a hertz or whatever, it comes in and it says, oh, bump's not hit anymore, so I'm not, I'm not going to do. So it has to have some sort of persistence if you want to keep that full routine. So do you go ballistic at that moment? And or are you... The question that Doug is asking, there's actually two different types of subsumption behaviors. The normal type is called a circular behavior. That would be like following along the wall. But when you get too close to the wall, you turn away from it. When you get too far away from the wall, you turn toward it. So you're serving it to stay along the wall. The other kind are called ballistic behaviors. Ballistic behaviors, as the name implies, are behaviors that keep running even when the, the sensor has shut off. So in Doug's case, he said, okay, you bumped into something, but you're not bumping into it anymore, but you still want to back up and rotate away and drive away from it. And so that's how, and point of fact, I'm getting ready to talk about the bumper, so let me describe that and see if that answers your question. Okay. But the bumper is a ballistic behavior. It's so the only you, ballistic okay. behavior. All right, so you, you are using, so. There's a timer used to okay. control okay. the All right, states. okay. Well, why don't we just jump right over to that now? Why don't we? Yes. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump past a bunch of the stuff I thought I was gonna describe here, because I don't think it's necessary to this group. Um, Here we go, here's a bumper. As I said, almost all these uh, behaviors are loop state machines, and the bumper has six states. And, uh, and once the state machine has been set off, it runs to completion. The only thing that can interrupt it is another bumper, another bumper press, which can reset the state back to state zero. But it runs to completion once it's initiated. Okay, so in, in your in your executive, essentially, that task just keeps keeps that task holds holds holds. The, yeah, what am I trying to say? Since it's doing continuous message, as yeah. long as it comes around and says, "I still have something to do," each time around it sends out a message. Yeah. And as long as it's subsuming the lower priority tasks, its message will get passed to the. Okay. Since the bumper, well, let, let me let me go ahead and jump ahead to this. The, I just throw in a couple of things here. Uh, the bumper switches in this robot are these switches underneath, and so we set up, you know, using the TPI and its structure, we set those up so we can read switches, and then we just have a read lefty, read right pin. Turns out those have to be debounced because they're very noisy switches, and so there's a little debounce function here, which is also a little state machine uh, that will run and generate a left and right bumper. So based on that, we read a bumper detector in one of these states. So I have a jam state, which we'll jump over here. But if we look down to where those are initiated, and really detect the one more so Here is what uh, Doug was asking about. State one says, stop. You just hit something, so you stop. And you notice that down there, it says bump timer. It says bump timer is equal to the current system clock plus a certain timeout. So this will continue running even after the bump is gone until that timer has expired. Second state is you back up, same sort of thing. The third state is that you try to rotate away from the, the detection. And there's quite a bit to that because I'll demonstrate that. And the fourth state is you go straight ahead a bit. The fifth state is you end the behavior. And the sixth state is what you do if the bumper is jammed, which is itself a little sequence. I think all of that is probably easiest to demonstrate just by actually doing it. And so I'm going to slow the speed on this one a little bit. So we were currently running at 300. That's of 
possible a thousand. Yes. And I'm going to slow that down to a hundred. So can you guys see the floor down here? Yes. Okay. So this this will be our, our simple uh, bumper demo number one. So I tell it to arbitrate, and of course Prowl takes over and starts driving it straight ahead. That's what Prowl is going to do. But if it runs into something, then the bumper will take over. Yeah, make it run a little faster. Let's turn the lights on. Stop, back up, rotate away, go forward. Once it started going forward, then the prowl took over again. Now, this is standard 1950s bump and run. When you hit something, you back up and rotate away from it. And there's a problem, those of you who robot builders among us, with the standard 1950s bump and run. What is the problem? <laughs> corners. Corners. Yeah. It can get caught in the symmetry of a corner. So this guy has two ways to get out of that. One of it is he counts bumps. And if the bump count gets too high, he turns around 180 degrees and runs away. And the other one is he reduces the amount of turn for each bump. So that if there is room to get through, it actually can. Let's see if I can demonstrate that. Let's start with the... Uh... Okay, so he would be stuck in a corner. And stuck means you're just bouncing from side to side, right? But he's counting these bounces. And after a while, he says, that's it. That's I'm it. out of here. I'm out of here. <laughs> However, it turns out, after, and I recommend this, I run my robots all the time. You can't learn anything about it without putting it in the floor and running it. And I mean for hours and watching it and making little changes to the code and seeing what it does. And after running it around a while, I found, you know, that's cool that it doesn't get stuck in a corner, but there's sometimes where there was an opening where it could have gotten through, but it didn't. It gave up and turned around. So I went back and wrote this code that would basically reduce the turning radius. Let's see if I can pull my jeans out of the way. Yeah, yeah. So that if there is enough room to get through there, <coughs> you can see that it's reducing the amount of turn. Oh, so close. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's a little six state machine. What's happening in that case is uh, when it's bouncing back and forth in the corner, it's keeping track of how many bounces it's done. Can you show us that? Yes. And uh, it uses, so it's got a count. And when that count reaches a certain level, then it'll rotate away. But in the meantime, it can use that count to determine how much it turns. So the higher, higher the count is, the less it turns. Is it remember where the bump happens? Say again? Is it remember where the bump happens? Oh, okay. It's, it's, it's not that simple. It's just, uh, basically what it's doing is uses a leaky integrator, which I use a lot of in my code. So you have a, a value that the real-time system is constantly trying to drain away to zero. So if you put 100 in that value, maybe a second or two later it wouldn't drain. And by, and by writing to that value, if you're writing fast enough, you can make it build. So you can use it to tell how often an event is happening by whether that builds or not. Yeah. It's the only reason that worked for you is that, I mean, it was only by luck that it would the same. No, no, because since we're going to do it, it reduces the amount of turn each time. So, I mean, if there's room to get through the center, it will. If it's allowed to do enough iterations to find it. Yeah. Here's another way to look at that. The more you turn when you have a bump, the cruder your sample is. If you, for example, were looking for an opening, you'd want to bump every quarter inch so that you accurately found that opening. But doing that for a normal navigation game, so 
So what you want to do when I think I could get through here, I'm going to reduce the amount of turn, I'm going to increase the sample, the fineness of the sample, so that I can find it over the No, that's not fine. That's intelligence. Yeah. <laughs> Just artificial <laughs> early. <laughs> and part of it is speed, too, because you want to find it as fast as you can. So you're basically doing a binary search. It's less exactly right, what right, it is. Okay, there we go. It's exactly what it is. It's a binary yeah. search. That's exactly what it is. Oh, time for the lights. Okay, uh, I'm going to run real quickly through uh, these last three behaviors. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to show you the code. We will come back to it. Uh, because it pretty much looks the same. Basically, uh, I've got a set of IR sensors under here, uh, left and right one, and I have a set of sonar in the front. And they both use the same algorithm. And the algorithm says if you see something on the right, then you turn left and you slow down. If you see something on the left, you turn right and slow down. If you see something on both sensors, you slow down to zero and continue rotating. Remember there was a function in there that said, um, I want a, a low-pass filter version of the velocity. It gives me about a second and a half. You can use that to tell which way you have been turning. So if you don't, if you've got a set of detect, you don't know which way to go. But a good guess is just keep going which other way. So that's what that's useful. So I'm going to turn all those functions on here. He said, hopefully. And it's the same thing. It says if my waypoint is on the right, I turn right. If my waypoint's on the left, I turn left. That's really all there is to it. it. There's a lot to the odometry to get to that point. And we turn around the IR sensors, the Polaroid sensors, and the sonar navigation behavior. Yes. All right. I'm, I'm jumping over a lot of things here because I'm assuming you guys know a lot of it. This particular uh, navigation function that I'm going to run, uh, it reads uh, waypoint lists from a, uh, waypoints from a list. And in this particular list I'm using right now, there's just two waypoints, wherever I started and a point over there somewhere. And so, again, I'm sorry, I have to get back on your feet to see what's going on here. say go, and it's going to go that way, I don't know, maybe six or eight feet, and try to turn around and come back. <clears throat> and I'm going to get in its way. Huh. Looks like I can. Uh, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Yep. You heard it like a cat? Yes, you can. Uh -oh. Come on. No, that's all right. It knows how to get out of there. <laughs> I had to because of these horrible chairs. It gets caught on these horrible chairs all the time. I had to write horrible chair function. <laughs> all right. What I can tell from looking at it is that the IR is being set off continuously by this uh, carpet. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to turn the IR off. Oh, yeah, I can hear the sonar now. Can you hear the sonar? See, they hear yours, aren't they? They're all pointing at you, though, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm about three feet away. Right. Yeah, it's almost 100 dB. You restarting it, right, Dave? Just for a very short time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. The IR was getting to steer all over the place. So it slows down, and it stops, and it calls rotate to the next waypoint. And this. Finally, you can actually see subsumption happen. That's here the bumper is subsuming the navigation behavior, but even when the bumper is not being pressed, the sonar just turned off. No, no, I turned off the IR. Oh, yeah. yeah, the IR has been set up on the car. You can't grab the cables and drag them around. Don't. Set there. Yeah, you can't. 
by the end of where you told us. All right. Well, I think it should be obvious to see from from this levels of behaviors that we can begin to add others into that big uh, subsumption loop. I want to show one more piece of code here, and then I think I'm done. How are we doing on time? Doing? We got plenty of time. We got till four. I, th I don't think we can handle it, but. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, uh, the cockroach might be a little wet. Yeah. It's like a lot more code to get rid of this one. That's not from Carl's uh, lab. Uh, just to make it more clear, uh, here is Maine itself. So this is everything that's running on the machine. And uh, so when you run main, basically we initialize the system and that uh, nucleo library that I built and then my own library. And then you just create tasks. So you see here it creates a sign-on task that comes up and says hello. And a print task, that's the one that's printing to that LCD. There's an idle task that measures the idle time on the computer. These are a couple of things that just flashed LEDs. There's a task that reads that user button. There's the task that will reload the parameter data if you need it. There's the sensor task. That's the one we looked at that's doing the subsumption loop of the motors. There's a rotate task, which is a basically like a service that other tasks can call if they want the robot to rotate. Uh, there's the bump press task, which is actually just testing to see if the bumpers have been pressed. There's the IR, there's the sonar, and there's uh, the navigation tasks. Uh, I had actually, I have a whole page in here on uh, odometry and navigation, but that probably should be a talk for another day, uh, because it's a, it's a whole world of this. <coughs> and then the last thing it does is it starts up the scheduler which is a dozen exit. Uh, and that's what runs all these other tasks. One of the things that really I was struck by uh, when I first fired up this little processor was how much faster and more efficient it was than the ones I was used to uh, working with. And I can give you an example here. Uh, this is a plot of the I could dump these plots in real time. I was going to actually set up and demo it here, but I don't want to do that demo. But this is from that balancing robot there, which is running the old 68332 processor. That's a 25 megahertz processor. And each one of these lines represents a task that's running. You can look over here and you can see the labels. So, uh, for example, on this one, uh, the, uh, the little GUI is this blue line here, and you can see it writing to the screen every once in a while. And the vertical value means nothing. It's the width of the lines, how long they're executing. This says that you can see how much time it takes each one of these tasks to execute. And it says we're using 35.6% of the available CPU cycles. Now that's the old system. Now here's what I just dumped uh, for, for this one here. Let me just start off by pointing out that CPU usage is 0.5%. <laughs> Everything we're running here is using less than half of 1% so when people come to me and say, you know, there's a whole lot more powerful ARM board you could be using on this. I'm talking, so what? What for? <laughs> I'm using less than a half a percent of the available cycles now. Uh, by the same token, my code size right now is about 125K. Uh, so up with a 512K of flash, I've used about a quarter of the available. Anyways, and, and what really struck me here was, go back and look at that other plot. The thing that eats up the most time uh, is the odometry. And uh, if we look at just a given function here, what do you have? Uh, so that's uh, about 100 uh, do I have that right? milliseconds. Yes. Uh, no, about 10 milliseconds uh, for a, there's, you know, odometry has a sine and a cosine and an arc tangent, a square root. And those transcendental functions eat up a lot of CPU time on a processor that has no. And now if we, so what does it say? That's the meter. So of our 35% uh, CPU cycles that are being used, 
26 percent. That is, right there. Uh, it's right here. And, you know, that sign and cosine. Uh, none of the others, the GUI is a little lower, none of the others are going to We come back and look at this processor, and we got to look hard to find. Uh, it's all in that sensors function. Okay, so what is the sensors? Is this red one here? So that's this one. Let's see if we can find one that's actually big enough to measure. Yeah, there's one. We can keep zooming in on it. There we go. Okay. So the odometry on this one, which was taken on the order of 10 milliseconds on that one, is taking something like one, so it's taking 169 microseconds. <laughs> and you look over here, it's still taking the lion's share of the processing time. But the lion's share, yeah, 169 microseconds. But three percent. Yeah. So uh, these are kind of fun to generate in the LMX uh, operating system. Generate, we'll generate these automatic results built in. Uh, calculate how much uh, processing time is being used by each task, how much memory, how deep the stack is, how much the stack is. Are you using floating point? This does use the Where's your top here. program running? I want to see top running on there. <laughs> well, that's kind of what this is. Sorry. Fine, I'm just messing. <laughs> Looking great. Good job. Okay, and I think at that point, uh, uh, I'm done. You're using two powerful. That's right. Yeah, can, you get, can you slow that clock down a little bit? <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's a, can. You're over a lot. Tell you, batteries. Had, my first <laughs> robots used a, a 2 megahertz HC11 8-bit process. Yeah. And we got those to do all kinds of things. Well, I mean, look at what people get to uh, Arduino's to do. Yeah. So, okay, I think, uh, as I say, there were some other things I was going to cover here that I don't think maybe belong today. Uh, yeah. We'll talk about odometry and navigation, things like that.
Our purpose is the journey to figure out what our purpose is. Alright. So, and so we have a competition you guys built for in particular? Yeah, we have multiple competitions throughout. Thank you, okay. You, 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 missed you. Doug's, you missed Doug's building robot five week course. Okay. Where he picks you from buying a cheap thirty dollar robot off of Amazon.com. And you Find put it together, you can't watch it. It's $30 after you think it's a sensor kits. And then you go through one by one how, do, how do we make these, how do we make things work? You know, how do you do alignment? Zero. How do you do a navigation? That's later. Navigation is number five. Let me put it in the Hardware instruction. We're coming from ground zero. So we are, we are here. <laughs> oh, right. so, so this is uh, the reason why I'm really heavily here with the edge system. I mean, that's how I. This is a Dallas uh, personal robotics uh, club. Then my I think that's in, in my around since 1984. Uh, scheduler. Okay. And uh, okay. I said agreement with DMS. Yes, yes. Which is not my idea. But I will say, we're in the school processor. There have been several times where I found a function that I had written. Yeah, but so I mean, you everyone use, just has an interest I in our building. So mostly, you know, it is. I was on the And say that the power hardware basically is using for or rovers or sometimes down the paint or bus and drawing bots and all this. I switched back twice a year. And you subtract the old bus from the new one that gives you the velocity difference. The advantage of that is that because you're, uh, you're not zeroing, you're not missing a count. Do you think when I zero am I missing a count? Or you think I could be? You could. I wonder how I got this That's going to be hard to do. Yes, we have high school. real-time operators. What was it and what was the design choices there? I guess we talk about that here. So we start having this kind of thing. I was just driving along. Why? Like we work. But that's the issue. Yes. We focus on our farm machines. Yes. It's not why are you rotating Z? Why are you rotating Z? Why are you rotating Z? Why are you Third Saturday, 
Yeah. Well, we also existing uh, some of us like um, um, we did a beer fighting. Right, you can easily make it work for a few months. Yeah, I have a new job. I'm interested. I'm so hard to make it look like, oh, it's not that hard. It's like a lot of cost. This has a tremendous waste. It's a little pink. We just have to go through a lot of programming. Yeah, it's a lot of that. Can you help us? A lot of work is done, but it only drives it to the next level. It doesn't even have to crack the manual once and find out which bit, which right. The current image is looking at me. Then it'll look at the value of the information. I think that's why I need to get some thoughts. I still think he's using it. You'll have to tell him. Send me a note. Yeah, so, so what does it what does it do? Yeah, it just doesn't stick the parts anymore. It still works. I've been using it, but it doesn't not recommend it. Oh, but why? Yeah, it's just like 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 it's